episode number 67, Iron Man Boulder with Kitty Cole. Welcome to the Pursuit of the Perfect Race. I'm Coach Terry Wilson, and with each episode, I bring stories of athletes to you that share their experiences at races in order for you to learn how to have your perfect race. We will hear stories from athletes of all ages, abilities, and races of all distances. So regardless of where you fit in, there's something in there for you. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Now let the pursuit begin. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Pursuit of the Perfect Race. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with my friend Kitty Co about her race at Ironman Boulder in wonderful Colorado. This race took place on June 10th, 2018. The temperature on race day was 67 and rose to 95. The temperature on the roads, though, were much higher, upwards of over 100. The water temperature on race day was 68 degrees. Welcome back to the show, Kitty. I look forward to hearing about your race at Ironman Boulder. Thanks, Terry. Thanks for the invite. Awesome. So, when did you decide to do this race? I decided to do Boulder. I'm I'm thinking it was early January. Uh, we got the Tri Club team invite, so we could do the the early sign up. And it was just after the first of the year. I can't tell you why it caught my eye for sure because I haven't done a full Ironman in five years. My last one was Ironman Louisville 2013. Wow! And I thought I was done with the full distance. Um, I love everything about the full distance, you know, the, um, the, the challenge, the extraordinary goal setting, uh, all of that crossing the finish line, you know, it's all great. Uh, but I thought I was done because my circle of friends here in Madison that I trained for all my Ironmans with, um, decided they were done, you know, life changes, moving on to other things. And I just didn't want to do all that training by myself. Um, I'm not on a, excuse me, a local team where I'd have the opportunity to, you know, have group weekly rides and that kind of thing. So I like the half distance. I really like the half distance a lot. I feel it's something that I can work to try to maintain um, my edge. And as certainly as I'm getting older, be competitive in my age group. But something happened in January. I mean, I'm sitting in front of the computer and chatting with some of the people on on the team, the big sexy team about, oh boy, what about Boulder? I love Boulder. I go there pretty much every year. I have a lot of friends out there and who knows what happened, but I hit the button and uh, signed up for Ironman Boulder early January. Wow. So how was your train going into this race? Training was good. Um, I had two half iron distance races that I thought um, were good stepping stones. They were early races. Got back to Madison, middle of April from Florida 70.3, and the weather was finally starting to turn. We had a crummy spring, so getting outside for longer rides was tough. And um, I could have done a few longer rides, but, you know, you get to the point of doing four plus to five hours on the kicker and you at a certain point you're just done or at least I was just done so you know I was able to get outside and um I drove to Boulder um May 9th so I went out there a month early and so I was able to do my last long rides on the course at altitude in Boulder and that helped me Oh, immensely. If I hadn't been able to do that, I'm not, I think I would have been part of that huge DNF that, that people didn't finish. Okay. Now, what kind of plan were you using going into this race? Well, I have a coach and, um, so, you know, we had good builds and some recovery built into it, but, um, swim, bike, run. I did swim with a a master's group here in Madison that helped me immensely. Jackie Herring is a local pro and she's a really good swimmer and she's a really good swim coach, master's coach. So I did that religiously all winter and did my run training on the treadmill, which I don't mind when I couldn't get outside. But, you know, in Wisconsin, you're on the trainer in the wintertime, anything less than 50 degrees. And I don't ride outside for the most part because that whole getting cold when I swim thing 
yeah, I get cold when I ride my bike in cold weather. Okay. Too. It's get cold. What was your most hours that you trained in one week going into Boulder? Oh, let's see. Eight, nine. I think my highest volume week was just shy of 20 hours. Okay. Mm-hmm. What was your longest swim, bike, and runs going into this race? My longest swim was the distance or very short, you know, very close to the distance. And I did that out in um, uh, in a, a private lake in Denver. So that was great. I did the BAM Masters Swim. So when I got out there, that's the Boulder Aquatic Masters Program. So as soon as they started supported open water swims at the reservoir, I did that. And that helped an awful lot because I'm swimming in the water and... You know, if got there early enough, you could do loops. So I did lots of 3,000 to 3,200 open water swims and then did the distance one time and felt good other than being super cold. Um, My longest bike ride was uh, 85, 90 miles, something like that. That was the longest one. And my longest run was 15 miles. Wow. So what kind of... Workouts gave you the confidence to go into Boulder prepared? Well, I've, I'm not a fast swimmer, but I've got the endurance um, and I'm comfortable in the water. Even if I get cold, I can keep myself going. So, um, like I said, the master swim over the winter felt like I had really um, improved my swim form. So I felt good about the swim. The bike, a lot of interval work on the bike for, you know, everything from VO2 to half Ironman intervals to long, long sets at, at threshold or just sub threshold. Um, a lot of, a lot of workouts that, I mean, every time I get on the bike on the trainer, it's a workout. I don't just ride because I, I'm, maybe I'm not disciplined enough, but it's just too darn boring. So every workout has a purpose. And then running, I was running really well, and my first week in Boulder, I broke my pinky toe on my left foot, so that had a huge effect. Um, I did do my longest run in Boulder. Uh, Pace-wise, it wasn't great because of my broken toe, but um, I've always wanted to do Boulder Boulder, and I've never been able to work it out, so I was out there. And I got up actually sharing a house with Eric and April Greenfield. So Eric and I got up at the butt crack of dawn at four-ish. And I ran just over eight miles before Boulder Boulder. We ran downtown Boulder to the start line of Boulder Boulder. And then I ran the 10K of Boulder Boulder. So that's what got me my long run of just over 15 miles on Memorial Day. Nice. Now, what kind of nutrition are you using for this race? Uh, I use Generation You Can. Okay. So my my body is fat adapted, and the using the concepts of metabolic efficiency. So I control my carbohydrates, and um, so going into the race, I felt really good. I have my calories, my electrolytes, all planned out. And because it was so hot leading into the race, I was preloading with electrolytes literally for five days before. And then um, I have a smoothie for breakfast on race morning. It's a, my standard smoothie, uh, approximately 400 calories. Um, I preload with you can and electrolytes 30 minutes before the start of the race. And then I use you can during the race. I make hypercaloric bottles. And I had uh, two with me to start and water between the handlebars and my bullet. And then special needs, I had another bottle already pre-mixed of you can because the stuff doesn't mix well on the fly. And so I was able to then fill up another bottle and a half and then I just add water to it. Um, I added a lot of water during the rest of the beat. I was trying to take in so much fluid because it was so bloody hot. But I, I use UCAN and then I also use pieces of a UCAN bar um, to supplement my calories, give me a different taste in my mouth. 
but okay. that's my nutrition is you can. Okay. In regards to all your training going into this race, were there any days where you just mentally didn't want to train? No, not really. Um, I had a goal, you know, I, at the time that I signed up, there were four women in my age group. And then just before I left for Boulder, or maybe it was just after I got to Boulder, another woman signed up. So there's five. I didn't realize until after the race that a woman had signed up literally like two days before. So now there's six women in the age group. It's pretty phenomenal when you think about it. This is 65 to 69. I'm 64. Not 65 yet, but just about. Um, but there's six women in the 65 to 69 age group racing a tough race, Ironman, at altitude in Boulder. So that was pretty darn cool. Um, but I wanted to be competitive in my age group. I had a goal. So on those days that I wasn't feeling it, um, you know, it was you got to go back to your why. That's what I tell people I work with, you know, what, what's your why? why? Why are you doing this? You know, we always have, I think everybody has days where they're a little bit down. I mean, if I was fatigued or tired um, or perhaps fighting something, that's different. Taking a day, you know, taking a day off or cutting back on intensity or something along that line. But to just blow off a workout, um, I don't do that. Okay, good. Now, how big of an issue is balancing life, work, and training with all the training volume that was going into Ironman Boulder? Well, I'm lucky in that it's just me and my two dogs. So I don't have a family that I'm responsible for. I have kids, but they don't live here. But um, so day-to-day responsibilities, you know, I can leave the house a little messy if I need to. <laughs> Some dishes in the sink if I need to. Um, you know, it's, uh, I, I can be, I can let that stuff kind of slide where perhaps other people can't. I don't have to make meals for other people. I got them for myself. So, but I do coach and I have nutrition clients. And, you know, so I definitely had to a better job as far as time management on weekends because weekends is where I catch up on a lot of emails, post workouts and um, correspond with people. And for people that work full time to be able to contact me and, and either meet face to face or have a conversation like you and I are having um, it makes the weekends a little crazy because that tends to be when you do your big workouts too. So you know, I, I definitely had to pay attention to that. And there were, there were some times that it's like, oh my gosh, I'm, you know, I'm falling behind here. And especially once I was out in Boulder, because then I was doing some big training days, but I think for the most part at all, it worked out. Okay. Okay. Now, but what was your mindset going into Boulder this year? Um, and I had two goals as I told my coach, one, I want to finish, which is a goal for any race that I do, because finishing is their guarantee. You know, we all know that things can happen on race day. So I had two goals. One is to finish, which is a goal for every race that I enter, because the finish line is never guaranteed. We always, we know that, you know, we never know what race day is going to be for us, and we don't know for sure what's going to happen. So I wanted to finish, and I wanted to finish on the podium. So those were my two goals. Okay. And, and I finished, I sort of finished on the podium, but not really. Okay. Now we know you got two boulder or you started traveling to boulder around May 9th, got there about a month ahead of time and you got an Airbnb with another athlete. How far away do you think you actually started to acclimate to the altitude? Well, the first two days was great. Had a great run, um, swam, felt it a little bit in the water, but those first two, two and a half days, you know, which is the theory that if you're going to do a race at altitude, you know, you've got yourself time to acclimate or you do it within 48 hours of arriving before your body knows that you're at altitude. So I definitely had that 48 hour window and then it really hit me and I really felt it. I felt the most swimming and running. When did you actually notice a difference whenever you got to altitude? After 10 days, I definitely started to feel better, feel like I could keep my heart rate down and um, and do workouts after 10 days. But up from that second day to the 10th day, it was it was pretty rough. Okay. And then after the 10th day leading into the race, you felt really good? I did. Um, 
the longer I was there, the better I felt as far as uh, altitude issues. The only time that last week before the race where I really felt it was uh, went to a hike and went up to, I don't know, over 8,000 feet. And when going uphill on the hike or pushing my effort, then my breathing was labored again, just like when I first got there. But other than that, I, I felt like I had done what I wanted to do as far as giving myself a chance where the altitude is concerned. Okay. So how was the process at the check-in of Ironman Village? We got there as soon, almost as soon as it opened up, and um, we were in and out, I'm wanting to say, within 10 or 15 minutes. It was smooth and no lines, just walked right through, and they did a great job. Good volunteers. Great. So going into Boulder, what was the last workout you did? Well, I always do a pre-race prep the day before. So if I can get in the water and do a little swim, 30-minute bike, and a 15-minute run. So that was the day before the race. Okay. As far as uh, um, what I would call an actual workout was the Friday before the race, Thursday before the race, I had a brick. So I did a bike and a run. Okay. Now, the night before the race, are you getting any type of meal that you want to make sure that you're getting before the race? I eat the same meal the night before any race that I do of any distance or any type of race. I eat salmon, I eat a sweet potato, and a cooked vegetable, either broccoli or green beans. Okay. Now, did this work really good for you? It does. Works fabulous for me. I've done it for a number of years. It just uh, it fuels my body. Um, the salmon is light in my stomach, so I don't have um, you know heavy protein, and it just sits really well. It doesn't bother my sleep. So, you know, if it uh, if it works, you stick with it. Great. Now, what time were you trying to get in bed the night before the race? I wanted to be in bed no later than nine. So the goal was eight thirty to nine, and I think I got into bed at eight forty five, eight fifty, something like that. Okay. Did you have a certain time that you wanted to try to get in bed? Yeah, right. Well, about the same time. I mean, I go to bed to go to sleep. I don't read or anything like that in bed. Okay. Now, once you actually get up the morning of the race, what does that look like for you? Because there was uh, the logistics of dropping off uh, special needs bags at the high school downtown and then having to drive out to the reservoir, um, got up a little earlier than usual. So I set my alarm for 320, 325, I believe. And I got up and um, made coffee. And so I got that ready. Um, I drink the, you know, it's called bulletproof coffee, but it's just, it's basically coffee with butter and MCT oil. And uh, so I had my coffee and uh, was collecting everything. I had made all my bottles and all my nutrition the night before, so I was putting all that together in the bags while I was drinking coffee, made a big smoothie, and um, drank most of it at the condo, but had a little bit left that I drank in the car on the way to drop off bags and go to transition. And, you know, double-check that we had everything and out the door, the goal was to be out the door by 4.30, and we walked out the door at 4.30. Wow. So you get to the race venue. Did you hit any traffic on the way there? No, no, it was fine. Um, Eric had had purchased a VIP pass for his wife, April, so that meant that we didn't have to ride the bus from the high school to the Boulder Reservoir. April was able to um to drive and park at the reservoir. So that made it super easy. So pulled into the reservoir and, you know, at that point you're on, you're on automatic pilot to go and set up transition, your nutrition on your bike, add things. I added something to my, um, my run bag, my early run nutrition. And, you know, and then you got your wetsuit and your goggles and ready to get in line for the swim. Wow. So after you get to transition, what kind of PSI are you using in your bike? Oh, uh, uh, because of the heat, I was between like 93 and 95. Okay. Not a, I, didn't go, I didn't go above 95. Okay. What kind of bike are you using? 
I've got a, a Trek speed concept and it's an extra small frame. So I now have, um, I'm riding 650 wheels because 700s won't fit on that frame. Uh, the joke is that my bike looks like it came from Toys R Us. It's so-, so you get done with uh, transition, you get everything set up in transition and you get ready to go to the swim. It's right there all together pretty much. I mean, transition is like right on the side of where you line up to get in the water, right? Right. And then so you're lining up there to get in the water. How was your nerves going into this? I felt really good. I mean, you always get a little nervous. I I, I kind of chuckle when people say they're not nervous at all. I don't know how that happens. But um I get nervous, but it's not like I let it overpower me. I use it as, um, you know, positive energy. So I'm standing there and I'm visualizing my swim. I'm visualizing what the day is going to be like. Um, and I, I felt pretty, pretty calm. I mean, I, looking at the water, it looked calm from the shore. And, um, you know, there were a lot of people there that I knew. And so I chatted with people, but I felt, I felt good. I felt resolute. And I, I just, I knew that we were going to have issues with, um, with the heat. So, um, you know, I was just trying to deal with, or at least think through what that was going to be like. But, you know, other than that, it's just, your mind is kind of on autopilot. Um, one of the things going through my mind at the start, you know, was the fact that I hadn't done one in, in five years. And so I was really loving the energy. And being part of the crowd, I mean, I've done a lot of work for Ironman Wisconsin, and normally I'm on the water as a lifeguard on the back of a jet ski. So, you know, even though I haven't been racing folds for five years, I've been out there with the athletes, registration prior, and then um, lifeguarding, and then at the finish line to catch people. So, but it's different when you're doing it. Right. And so I was really loving the fact that, you know, I was in the middle of all this wonderful energy and, you know, people asking, is this your first? This is my first. And people around that were chatting that that was really nice. And I think that 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 helped keep me calm, too. Okay. now, as far as your strategy for the race, what was your strategy for the race? Did you have like a certain time that you wanted to swim, the bike and the run? Did you have a certain mental way of that you wanted to attack it or what did you have? Uh, The swim, I had a time goal that I wanted and um, I lined up with a 121 to 130 group. My goal was 125, 126. I felt that that was totally doable. I've done um, a 125 and change. And, um, but I was off about five minutes from my time. And I know that was just from the fact that the second half of the swim, I got cold and I slowed down. So, you know, you're not going to win it in the swim, but you're going to lose it in the swim. Um, so I, yeah, I got out of the water and it's like, eh, I, I did what I thought I was doing based on what I felt like my pace was in the second half. It was okay. No, it didn't. It wasn't anything that bummed me out. Like, oh my God, I didn't make my swim time. Now I'm off for the whole day. Um, T1, my transitions are normally good, but uh, uh, at Boulder, T1 was a disaster because I had an equipment malfunction and a zipper that wouldn't zip and wouldn't stay zipped. So T1 was a real bummer. Did you have any issues with that? try top before the race or was it just during the race just just that one time now this is a new kit right i've worn that top i've worn the top in training rides i wore the top um in a in one race previous to that so i hadn't had any issues i think what happened is it just my hands were numb from the swim and the first volunteer helping me i think what happened is she started to zip it and it was off track. And so really? she was trying to force it up and it wouldn't go up. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things that happened. So, you know, in hindsight, I should have worn it underneath my wetsuit. It might've helped keep me warm. And I certainly wouldn't have lost close to 15 minutes in transition because once we got it zipped up, it wasn't on track, but I walked out of the T1 tent and it popped open. 
and there were two people standing there cheering and on the other side of the fence, which uh, I immediately went over to them and said, I, I need help. Um, and so we got it. We got myself put together. So I wasn't indecent and I wasn't, you know, I was covered and, uh, and got to the bike, but it cost me quite a bit of time. Okay, so, so yeah, T1 normally, you know, under five minutes for sure. And I was 15. Okay. Um, as, as the bike goes, I was hoping to do, well, I, my, my first goal was I was hoping in, to be in the neighborhood of seven hours. My stretch goal was to be in the neighborhood of 6.45 to 6.50. And before the end of the first loop on the bike, I knew that that was probably not going to happen because of the conditions. So at that point, it was just a question of keeping my heart rate steady, doing what I could do, and stay as hydrated as I possibly could because it was carnage on the bike course, Terry. It was just carnage. Really? Yeah. Um, people riding, just pulling over to the side of the road, getting off their bike and sitting down. You know, and I, I always try to ask, are you okay? Yep, I'm done. Yep, I'm done. Um, lots of people were overheated and sick and saw a few crashes people walking up the the climbs there were th three climbs two significant climbs and on the second loop lots of people walking up the climbs and um you know i felt bad for them because they were just they were done on the second loop of the bike i had a hard time pushing power my power dropped drastically because i just was so hot and uh, it was, it was crazy, you know, so it was just trying to stay as steady as I could. Mentally, how hard was that to stay going whenever you're seeing all the people around you, even people that are, I'm sure younger than you and younger and stronger than you on the side of the road, just going, I'm done. And you're like, oh my gosh, I have mm. 20, 30 years on you and you're over here stopped and I can't be as strong as you like. I mean, mentally, that had to play a toll on you, right? It did. Uh, it did on the bike, It more so on the run. But on the bike, I just, I felt badly because, you know, anybody that puts in the kind of training for Ironman that's required and to, to DNF, whether it's you pull the plug or there's a medic out there that says you're done or you crash, you know, it's it's heartbreaking because goals and dreams are shattered right there. And that, you know, but you got to put put your head down and just say, I'm glad you're okay. Um, I got to keep going. I got to keep going. I never had a dark spot on the bike. I mean, I was, I, I was hot and I was miserable, but I never felt like I have to stop. I can't do this. I never had that feeling on the bike. I knew I was slowing down, and I thought, oh, man, I, I hope I don't have an issue as far as a cutoff. I didn't think I did, and I didn't, but I was out there a long time. But, you know, I, I was able to keep myself going and, um, and, and felt like I could do it. On the front end of it, did you have a strategy where you wanted to hit a certain cadence or power number or speed or anything like that? Um, I go for power, so I was, my goal was mid-zone two. Okay. And I monitor my heart rate. I I don't monitor my cadence on race day. I know what my cadence is. My cadence is pretty darn steady. So there's only so many things you can monitor. And, you know, you're looking at your computer instead of looking at the road. So the thing that I monitor is, uh, is my power. Because if I'm pushing too hard, then I know that, you know, I'm not going to be running and I'm going to be suffering. So that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, miles per hour. Yeah. I look at it on a second screen occasionally, but I look at where my miles are and, and my power, because if I'm trying to push a certain mile per hour and it's, I'm pushing too hard on a day, like it was at Boulder, then I'm not going to be mid zone two. Right. I'm going to be pushing up into zone three. So for your zone two, you're looking at a power number. Are you going off of a normalized power? Or are you going off of a three to 10 second average? What does that look like for you? Um, I generally do a three second average of, um, of average power because then it shows me what I'm doing. I've got normalized power that I can look at, but it's on another screen. 
if I choose to. But every time I'd look at my computer and see where my numbers were as far as that three-second average, that's enough for me. Okay. You know, and get a feel for it. Okay. Now then, as far as the road quality for this bike course, how was it? The roads themselves were pretty good. Um, I was a little disappointed because I had ridden quite a few training rides on the course when I got to Boulder, and there was a lot of road dirt and debris on the shoulder. And I thought for sure, like Ironman Wisconsin, that the bike crew would be out there and sweep those roads, and they did not sweep those roads. Really? Yeah, that was disappointing to me because it was a safety issue, and um, it didn't look like that they had they had been swept. So, you know, I mean, you're not riding on the shoulder for the most part, but on Highway 36, there's traffic in both directions, and there wasn't a lot of road dirt up there to begin with, but there's construction up there. So there were spots that had, and it wasn't trash or anything like that, it was just, you know, rocks and dirt and stuff like that. So um, so you had to be heads up and, and be careful. I didn't have any issues but I would have liked to have seen those roads swept. Okay. As far as the bike goes, is there anything that you would tell someone to be aware of that hasn't done this bike course before? It's a good, it's a good bike course. It's, um, it's two loops and, and you've got out and back on the diagonal highway. The one thing I would say about the bike course is that um, there, there are sections where it looks like you're going downhill but you're working really, you're working hard and um, there's a lot of false flats. So you got to be really cognizant of that because on false flats, of course, if you wind up pushing too hard, you can really burn yourself out. So the diagonal highway had false flats and we did that, that um, out and back twice. And then on the course itself, there were some of those where it's so funny. It just, it looks like you're going downhill, but you're not, you're going at one or 2% uphill. Gotcha. Now, as far as the bike course goes and your bike ride, did you execute everything the way you wanted to? Uh, I'd say yes. I mean, on the second loop, did I push, did I, you know, have the power output that I, that I should have had? No, but the conditions were such that that's all I could do. And you did the best that you could during the changing situation of the race. Absolutely. Okay. Now, did you know your nutrition plan on the bike? Oh, absolutely. I, I, that's what I do, Terry. So I've got it all planned out. <laughs> that's what I do. So how many calories per hour were you trying to get? I generally am approximately 175 to 200 calories an hour. Okay. Now you get done with the bike course. You get to the final mile or two where you're entering the city. You're getting ready to get to the high school. Are you doing any type of transition to help prepare to start running? Well, transition for the first time, T1 and T2 was both at the Boulder Reservoir. So okay. we rode back to the res and not into town. Oh, okay. The, Last year you were at the – or the T2 was at the high school. So this year it was different. Yes, Yep, everything was at the reservoir, which um, was which was nice. Um, so that last stretch coming in, probably the last three miles, I downshifted so I could spin, really keep my legs moving. Um, my feet were uncomfortable. Um, I mentioned that I broke my toe the first week out there. Um, literally, I had to cut out the top of my bike shoe, my left bike shoe because it rubbed on the spot where that toe was broken. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, my bike shoe looked really bad. I, you know, <laughs> that was all cut out, but it was the only way I could do it. But my feet were so hot from the, from the heat radiating, radiating up off the pavement that that toe, that foot was pretty uncomfortable. So, you know, I, I did a lot of spinning coming in those last couple of miles to make sure my legs were awake at least. Um, but you know, tried to drink what I had on my bike, but everything was so hot. It was so unpalatable at that point, those last miles. It was, it was just awful. Okay. So you get into T2. How does T2 go for you? T2 was okay. Um, my left foot, broken toe foot was very swollen, the whole foot. So 
was a little bit to get my bike shoe off. And then it took a little bit to get my running shoe on because um, my foot was really uncomfortable. And I mean, it was the whole foot was swollen at that point. So I took the time to go barefoot in the grass for at least a minute or so inside the tent of T2 just to let my foot cool down and um, got my running shoes on. They had uh, ice so we could get cold drinks in T2, which doesn't usually happen, which was... That's beautiful that they have that. Oh, that was a lifesaver. I mean, they did everything that they could to take care of us. Did they have the misting fans in there as well? They did. They had a fan also. That's awesome. Um, So, I mean, just to let your core body temperature cool down, I mean, what a... um, what a day of extremes. I was so cold, I was numb on the swim. And then I come in off the bike and I'm so hot that just letting that mister wash over me helped to bring my core temperature down. So got myself all ready. I wasn't moving fast to be sure, but um, got myself out of out of T2 as quickly as I could. Because at that point, then the run was from the reservoir to J Road, and then from J, we take a right, and I am brain dead on what that first road is that we turned left on. But the first four, 4.2 miles is net uphill, and it was all in the sun. Wow, so like no shade, and you're already hot. Mentally, that had to be really hard for you. How did you tackle that? Well, I had done three runs from the res to mile five, so I knew what to expect. Okay. And I know it was going to be hard and, you know, you got to keep your heart rate down because if that heart rate gets jacked starting out on that race, because you come out of the reservoir and you've got that first hill, which is a bugger. So I mentally knew that I was going to be walking. So I was going to try to keep my heart rate in check and take whatever I could get in transition towel. I, you know, they had towels that had been soaking in ice water for us when we left and um, and just do as fast a walk as I could on the downhill if I could start running a little bit, but I kept it really easy because, like I said, on the bike, on that first four miles, it looked like oh I got a downhill here, but guess what? It wasn't a downhill. Right. It was a it was a false flat. So it was just doing what I could because at four point two miles you get on the trail and you have a downhill and you have shade. Not for long, but you get a little bit of a break. Right. Now, walking out of transition two, that had to be really hard because I'm assuming there's a lot of spectators there and there's a lot of support on the course right there at that point. And everybody's cheering you on. How hard is it to walk for you? Oh, it wasn't hard to walk at all. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it wasn't hard to walk at all. Um, I mean, you're at the reservoir. It's dirt and sand. And, um, you know, people that I knew, it was like I wanted that energy from them. You know, it's like, oh, kitty, you made it off the bike. Yay, kitty. You know, so teammates, big, sexy teammates were there. Um, it Just having people you know, there to give you a quick peck on the cheek or, you know, a pat on the back, but to hear your name um, is a huge boost. Great. So So you get done with the first few miles of the run, you're into the shade, you're on the trail in the city now. How does that go for you? Not well. Um, I just, I was spent. Metabolically, um, I was just so darn hot. My heart rate when I tried run was elevated, um, but more so in that first half, I was just in agony from my foot with the broken toe. It um, it was just throbbing. So I did what I could. I tried to run. That didn't go so well. I was getting nutrition in me, getting um, cold fluid in me because they had cold fluids at the aid station. Um and it was, and again, as I had mentioned, there was carnage on the bike course. Um, there was carnage on the run course. I mean, you got runners down the whole time with um, medics were all over the run course on bikes. Fabulous job. They were everywhere. Down, they had they runners with IVs 
waiting for ambulances to come pick them up. Wow. And you have to, so, the, you know, you had asked about mentally on the bike course, seeing people walk off the course, seeing people down on the side of the road. On the bike course, I was able to compartmentalize that. Um, I had a harder time doing that on the run course because you're standing right next to somebody and they're unconscious or somebody is semi-conscious and, you know, they've already started an IV or they're trying to start an IV on this person. Uh, that was hard. That that was hard. I mean, it was heartbreaking because their day was done, but it was also heartbreaking because, um, you know, I mean, that can be life-threatening. Right. I. You know, I had someone close to me die in a running race. So every time I see a runner that's down, um, that's always, that pops into my mind. So that made it harder. The first loop of the run, I knew I was slow as all get out because I was having a hard time running. And I think I finally got um, my temperature down enough and um, my foot was... What, I think the swelling was going down, so the pressure and the rubbing inside my shoe wasn't quite so much. So I was able to start doing more running in the second half. But um, but it was still mentally a tough place. I will tell you that um, it's the first race I've done that I went very dark in the second loop of the run. Um very you know, dark. Was, what do you mean very dark? Oh, my mood, my um I'm I'm a very positive person. You know, I see the glasses half full, at least half full. And on the second half of that run, it was just like, you know, what the hell am I doing out here? What what business do I have doing this again? Um and I knew I was flirting with the time cutoff because didn't check my watch to see what time I went into the water. And with the rolling start format of the swim, you need to know what time you cross that mat for the start of the swim, because that's when your time starts for the race. And the finish line might still be up and you cross the finish line, but you might be a DNF because you've gone over the time based on when you went into the water. And I knew that, but at the start of the race, I was, you know, I was in a happy place. I was all caught up. And it wasn't until I started swimming that I thought, rats. That's not what I said, but I'll say that here. Um, rats. <laughs> I didn't look at my watch to see what time it was. So, um, and I knew that on the second loop of the run. I knew that I was going to be flirting very closely with going over the time limit, which I did, unfortunately. Wow. So emotionally, when did you make that shift of um, in a good place to I'm in an okay place to, okay, I'm really in a dark place? Where did that shift actually happen for you? I'd have to say about mile 16 to 18, somewhere in there. Yeah, it's a two-loop run course with a lollipop. And so it was after the stick or the lollipop that it was dark. It was very dark. And they didn't have enough lights on the run course. Um, I, I had a little light that I held in my hand, but it wasn't very bright. And it was really dark out there. And I'll tell you, I don't like running in the dark. It scares me. <laughs> so... You know, and I'm on this path, and it's all wooded, and I'm thinking, there's animals in there. But, God, there could be a bear in there, and it'd eat me, and no one would find me until two days later. You know, I mean, stupid stuff running through your head. But um, it was hard to see where you were going and had to be careful of your footing. And so that was about the time. So I'm on the second loop. It's just dark as all get out. And, um, you know, going from aid station to aid station, and I knew that we had to do the second loop out pretty, you know, it was, I don't even know what the location of it was, but I heard the music from um, the tent that was the tri-dot and bass. Um, uh, they had a, you know, they had a big aid station set up and they were playing music and I couldn't hear the music. And I kept telling myself, 
I don't want to go back out and do that loop a second time. It's so far out. Oh my God, I'm just, I'm done. I'm, I just don't want to do this. Um, but I knew people out there. So, you know, once I got there, it was great because, you know, they tried to lift me up and everybody was in a bad place at that point. Um, you know, so it was just kind of a death march to keep myself going. Um, I, I wanted to stop. I was trying to find reasons to give myself to stop. But as I said to you before we started, it's not in my DNA to stop. So I didn't stop. Um, and it was crazy because the mile markers, just about the whole run were off to start out with, to start out with the mile markers were short and then the mile markers were closer to being on. And then the mile markers were long and, uh, a cup, my, my Garmin died on the run. So I didn't even know what I was doing at that point. And, and that happened about the same time that mile 16 to 18 and um, <laughs> it it was just, you know, it was kind of a comedy of errors. But then I got to mile 25 and you had to do another loop. And I mean, people were just bitching at that point because it should have been a half mile out, half mile back and then a little under the bridge to get to the finish line. Well, uh, according to a teammate, the run was long. I don't know because my Garmin died, but the run was mis mismarked and it was four to five tenths of a mile long. Wow. Now, emotionally, did you have a moment where you just lost it and just started crying? No, no. I wanted to, but I knew that if I went there, that would have probably been the end for me. Um, so I didn't. I didn't cry until I crossed the finish line. Then I cried. <laughs> wow. Now, as far as you getting to the last five miles of the run, how was that? It was one foot in front of the other. It was, you know, channeling every every person, you know, that's that's I've ever, that I've been involved with in triathlon, channeling the energy from you know, family members, kids, um, you know, a, a son, a Marine daughter who's overcome things. Um, I had uh, carrying mementos of two um, really good friends that have both died who are triathletes. One died just two weeks before the race here, bike crash here in Madison. Um, I used all of that. You know, I used the, the positivity and the energy um, from everybody in my life to, to get me to the finish. It was hard. It was hard. Wow. Now you get to the last 800 yards of the finish line, before the finish line, the barricades start lining the road. How was that? That was sweet. <laughs> it, it was really sweet um, because I knew I was going to finish. You know, I don't know. This is something that I've always characterized to people that I've worked with is that in a race, you always know when you're going to finish. Sometimes that's before you even start. You know you're going to finish that day. Sometimes, you know, it's at a certain point, a certain mile, or something happens that you just know I'm going to finish today. And sometimes you don't know you're going to finish until you cross the finish line. I didn't know at Boulder that I was going to finish until I crossed the finish line. Wow. Mm -hmm. How was the finish shoot experience for you? Oh, it was great. I mean, I had people waiting for me. You know, they, um, it's a long day for people that are out there being Sherpas or cheering. And, um, and I had people that, that were there that, that didn't leave and they waited for me. So it was really special. Um, you know, the lights and, and everything and, uh, great volunteers at Boulder, really great volunteers. So people were there to help you and take care of you. But, um, like I said, it was, it was a powerful finish because I didn't know that I was going to make it until I made it. Wow. How was your recovery process thereafter? Other than being tired, not bad. Um, my legs were sore. My bottom of my feet just burned. And I think that was more from the bike ride, the, the heat. I had hot spots, no blisters, but I had hot spots. 
And, um, you know, the next day you got the quad soreness and the hip soreness, so you walk a little funny. But um, what wasn't a good move on my part is I left Boulder two days after the race. So I left Tuesday morning to start my drive back home to Madison. That wasn't a good move. I should have given myself a couple more days. So two days in the car wasn't wasn't great, but I stopped a lot. I've got I had my two dogs with me, so we stopped and went for walks and and um, you know just got out of the car and got fresh air. So and since I've been back, I got home Wednesday oh, about five o'clock or something like that. I've been tired, but nothing hurts. And um, my toes recovering finally. It's still about just over twice the size that it should be, but it doesn't hurt anymore. Um, but I haven't really done workouts. I've done walks, and I may go for a little run this afternoon. I'm going to bike tomorrow with somebody. Just kind of a easy, more casual day or anything like that. But so the recovery is the recovery has been good. Not a problem. Okay. Now. Looking back on it, how well prepared for this race do you think you were? I think I was well prepared. I feel like it. I, I um, emotionally, mentally, I was I was prepared going back in. Um, physically, I made the decision to work remotely from um, from Boulder, so um, I could acclimate to the altitude. That made a huge difference. If I would do anything differently, maybe I would try to do some more long rides, but I, you know, it worked out that I fit in what I could based on the weather in Wisconsin. If I do another one and it would be early, I'd go someplace to train um, away from the cold in Wisconsin to get more ride time, outside ride time in. I'd do that differently. But I felt like um, uh, my coach and I had a good plan and executed the training and executed the race as best I could considering the, the conditions. Good. Now, what did you learn about yourself or the race that you'd like to pass on to someone who hasn't done this race before? The race itself is a good race. It's, um, it's a great swim. I mean, when you've got an, a 2.4 mile swim and you only have two turns, you know, practice your sighting. So you swim straight lines but it, it's a great swim. I like swimming in the reservoir. And I'm not going to say it's an easy swim because you're doing 2.4 miles. But thinking of, <clears throat> of some of the races, you know, where you're turning, 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 um, it's really pleasant from that standpoint. So, you know, make sure you sight well so you can swim straight lines. The bike, um, short, punchy climbs and false flats. So on a better weather day, the bike course this year, and if they do the same bike course next year, it'll be fast, super fast. Um, because you've got climbing, you've got false flats, but you've got some great downhill recovery. Oh, my God, there are sections where you can just fly downhill, and that was fun. So it's a, it's a really good bike course. I like the bike course a lot. Just made it hard to do it in, you know, full on sun and the heat and wind. Um, we had some pretty significant wind out there too. Um, the run, a lot of that boulder path through town is on concrete. So it gets a little hard on your hips and, and on your back. But um, you got to be able to run in sun and heat and um, there's not much flat section. So it's uphill or downhill. You know, it's a marathon as long as you train with hill repeats and tempo runs and things like that, you should be fine. You know, you just got to go with the conditions that you get on race day. And I think that's what we did on Sunday. And uh, unfortunately, it wound up not being a day for 31% of the, you know, the participants, which is heartbreaking when you think about it. It is. Now, for first timers, what advice would you give them going into this race? Well, well, the altitude's a factor. If you're coming from flatland, like in your medicine, um, to go out there and to push effort without knowing how your body responds to altitude, I think you're doing yourself a disservice because it is a factor. So in training, you know, if you can get to altitude to do a race or do a training block, even if it's for three, four, five days or something like that, I'd highly recommend that, you know, to just show up in 
especially if this would be your first Ironman at altitude, I think it would be very challenging. If I was coaching somebody and they, they wanted to do Boulder as their first Ironman, um, I would try to dissuade them of that idea. Okay. Now, how could Ironman have made your race experience better? I think, I think Ironman did a great job. You know, I, I think that there were a few little things that could have been done um, from the, the staff, the local staff. One, the bike course should have been swept. I, I think that that should have been done. And on the run, there should have been more lights for when it was dark for athletes that were out there after dusk. But other than those two things, everything else was great. And the volunteers, like at so many races, they were phenomenal. And they took care of people considering the conditions. They had ice at aid stations on the bike, which normally you don't get ice. They had ice at the run aid stations. They, they did a good job of uh, taking care of people considering the conditions. Okay. So what's next for you? Um, I've got uh, Ohio 70.3 the end of July. My goal is to uh, qualify for... 70.3 Worlds 2019 because it's Nice and I want to go to Nice. So that's my goal. And, you know, Terry, I did the distance at Boulder. It wasn't pretty, but I did the distance and I'm trained. So maybe maybe I need a little redemption before the end of the year. What do you mean? What do I mean? <laughs> what do I mean? <laughs> you, know, you know exactly what I mean, Terry. <laughs> I've, I've, I've got a couple of buddies that are saying, hey, kitty, why don't you go to Maryland? So, well, think about it. There's Maryland. There's Louisville. I mean, I think Louisville would be well, great. I've done Louisville. I don't want to do Louisville again. I don't like repeating races. I like uh, I like doing new races. That's, well, Montreal's you know, still my, open. Yeah, but I don't know anybody that's doing it. In Maryland, I've already got, I mean, I got a room in a house if I want to go. So it's my lodging's all set. I got, you know, what, six or seven and big sexies that are doing it. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about it. My, my coach is at uh, Time Trial Nationals this weekend, so we're going to talk next week. Wow. Well, you have to let yeah. me know. I'd love to have you back on after your next one and <laughs> hear you get your redemption. Yeah. All right. It's a deal. Awesome. Well, I've already asked you what your definition of a perfect race is, so I have a little something different for you. Okay. So what is the hardest workout you've ever done, and what about this workout made it so hard for you? Oh, my God. I think the hardest workout I've ever done is a five-hour training ride in the house on the trainer. Hardest workout. Because it's not a physically hard workout, but it's a mentally hard workout. You know, I, either you're watching TV, you're listening to podcasts, which is what I like to do. Um, you know, you're trying to hit numbers. You got the workout to do. You're in, in your house. There's no fresh air. It's just mentally tough. There's no stimulation, but you got to get it done. So the, that long trainer ride, I think that's the hardest workout to do. Now, put me on a treadmill. I've run 20 miles on a treadmill. I didn't like it, but I can do it. But on the bike, on the trainer, ugh, it just kills me. Wow. I do it. Well, yeah. Katie, I just want to thank you so much for your time today and you sharing everything. I've really learned a lot from you. I look forward to following you in the future. Hopefully we get to hear your story at Ironman Maryland later on this year. Okay, Terry, thanks. Thank you so much. Have a good day, okay? Okay. Thanks for tuning in today. I hope you were able to learn something from today's episode. If you enjoy the show, please take a minute to leave a review on iTunes or share it with a friend. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you'd like to see pictures from this athlete's race, learn more about who I am, what I'm doing, or be on the show yourself to share your story, check out my website at CoachTerryWilson.com. Until next time, continue the pursuit.